side. What did the police think of Eva Kane? That she was by no means the innocent victim that the public thought her. I was quite a young chap at the time, and I remember hearing it discussed by my old chief and Inspector Trail, who was in charge of the case. Trail believed, no evidence, mind you, that the pretty little idea of putting Mrs. Craig out of the way was all Eva Kane's idea, and that she not only thought of it, but she did it. Craig came home one day and found his little friend had taken a shortcut. She thought it would all pass off as natural death, I dare say, but Craig knew better. He got the wind up and disposed of the body in the cellar and elaborated the plan of having Mrs. Craig die abroad. Then, when the whole thing came out, he was frantic in his assertions that he'd done it alone, that Eva Kane had known nothing about it. Well, Superintendent Spence shrugged his shoulders, nobody could prove anything else. The stuff was in the house. Either of them could have used it. Pretty Eva Kane was all innocence and horror. Very well she did it, too. A clever little actress. Inspector Trail had his doubts that there was nothing to go upon. I'm giving you that for what it's worth, Monsieur Poirot. It's not evidence. But it suggests the possibility that one at least of these tragic women was something more than a tragic woman, that she was a murderess, and that if the incentive was strong enough, she might murder again. And now the next one, Janice Cortland. What can you tell me about her? Well, I've looked up the files. A nasty for the goods. If we hanged Edith Thompson, we certainly ought to have hanged Janice Cortland. An unpleasant pair, she and her husband, nothing to choose between them. And she worked on that young man till she had him all up in arms. But all the time, mark you, there was a rich man in the background, and it was to marry him she wanted her husband out the way. Did she marry him? Spence shook his head. No idea. She went abroad. And then? Spence shook his head. She was a free woman. She'd not been charged with anything. Whether she married or what happened to her, we don't know. One might meet her at the cocktail party any day, said Poirot, thinking of Dr. Rendell's remark. Exactly. Poirot shifted his gaze to the last photograph. And the child, uh, Lily Gamble? Too young to be charged with murder. She was sent to an approved school. Good record there. Was taught shorthand and typing and was found a job under probation. Did well. Last heard of in Ireland. I think we could wash her out, you know, Monsieur Poirot, same as Vera Blake. After all, she'd made good. People don't hold it against a kid of twelve for doing something in a fit of temper. What about washing her out? I might, said Poirot, if it were not for the chopper. It is undeniable that Lily Gamble used the chopper on her aunt. And the unknown killer of Mrs. McGinty used something that was said to be like a chopper. Perhaps you're right. Now, Monsieur Poirot, let's have your side of things. Nobody's tried to do you in, I'm glad to see. No, said Poirot, with a momentary hesitation. I don't mind telling you I've had the wind up about you once or twice since that evening in London. Now, what are the possibilities amongst the residents of Broad Hinney? Poirot opened his little notebook. Eva came. If she is still alive, would be now approaching sixty. Her daughter, of whose adult life our Sunday comet paints such a touching picture, would be now in the thirties. Lily Gamble would also be about that age. Janice Cortland would now be not far short of fifty. Spence nodded agreement. So, we come to the residents of Broadhinney, with a special reference to those for whom Mrs. McGinty worked. Ah, that last is a fair assumption, I think. Yes, it is complicated by the fact that Mrs. McGinty did occasional odd work here and there, but we will assume for the time being that she saw whatever she did see, presumably a photograph, at one of her regular houses. Agreed. Then as far as age goes, that gives us as possibles, first the Weatherby's, where Mrs. McGinty worked on the day of her death. Mrs. Weatherby is the right age for Eva Kane and she has a daughter of the right age to be Eva Kane's daughter, a daughter said to be by a previous marriage. And as regards the photograph, or share, no positive identification from that is possible. Too much time has passed. Too much water, as you say, has flowed from the waterworks. One can but say this. Mrs. Weatherby has been decidedly a pretty woman. 
She has all the mannerisms of one. She seems much too fragile and helpless to do murder. But then that was, I understand, the popular belief about Eva Kane. How much actual physical strength would have been needed to kill Mrs. McGinty is difficult to say without knowing exactly what weapon was used. Its handle, the ease with which it could be swung, the sharpness of its cutting edge, etc. Yes. Yes, why we never managed to find that. But go on. The only other remarks I have to make about the Weatherby household are that Mr. Weatherby could make himself, and I fancy does make himself, very unpleasant if he likes. The daughter is fanatically devoted to her mother. She hates her stepfather. I do not remark on those facts. I present them only for consideration. Daughter might kill to prevent mother's past coming to stepfather's ears. Mother might kill for same reason. Father might kill to prevent scandal coming out. More murders have been committed for respectability than one would believe possible. The Weatherbys are nice people. Spence nodded. If, I say if, there is anything in this Sunday comic business, then the Weatherbys are clearly the best bet, he said. Exactly. The only other person in Broadhinney who would fit in age with Eva Kane is Mrs. Upwood. There are two arguments against Mrs. Upward, as Eva Kane, having killed Mrs. McGinty. First, she suffers from arthritis and spends most of her time in a wheeled chair. In a book, said Spence enviously, that wheeled chair business would be phony, but in real life it's probably all according to Cocker. Secondly, continued Poirot, Mrs. Upward seems of a dogmatic and forceful disposition, more inclined to bully than to coax which does not agree with the accounts of our young Eva. On the other hand, people's characters do develop, and self-assertiveness is a quality that often comes with age. That's true enough, conceded Spence. Mrs. Upward, not impossible, but unlikely. Now, the other possibilities. Janice Cortland? Can, I think, be ruled out. There is no one in Broadhinney the right age. Unless one of the younger women is Janice Cortland, with her face lifted. <laughs> Don't mind me. Just my little joke. There are three women of thirty-odd. There is Deirdre Henderson, there is Dr. Render's wife, and there is Mrs. Guy Carpenter. That is to say, any one of these could be Lily Gamble, or alternatively, Eva Kane's daughter, as far as age goes. And as far as possibility goes? Poirot sighed. Eva Kane's daughter may be tall or short, dark or fair. We have no guide to what she looks like. We have considered Deirdre Henderson in that role. Now for the other two. First of all, I will tell you this. Mrs. Rendell is afraid of something. Afraid of you? I think so. That might be significant, said Spence slowly. You're suggesting that Mrs. Rendell might be Eva Kane's daughter or Lily Gamble. Is she fair or dumb? Fair. Lily Gamble was a fair-haired child. Mrs. Carpenter is also fair-haired, a most expensively made-up young woman. Whether she is actually good-looking or not, she has very remarkable eyes. Lovely, wide-open, dark blue eyes. Now, Poirot, Spence shook his head at his friend. Do you know what she looked like as she ran out of the room to call her husband? I was reminded of a lovely, fluttering moth. She blundered into the furniture and stretched her hands out like a blind thing. Spence looked at him indulgently. Romantic, that's what you are, Monsieur Poirot, he said. You and your lovely, fluttering moths and wide-open blue eyes. Not at all, said Poirot. My friend Hastings, he was romantic and sentimental. Me, never. Me, I am severely practical. What I am telling you is that if a girl's claims to beauty depend principally on the loveliness of her eyes, then no matter how short-sighted she is, she will take off her spectacles and learn to feel her way round, even if outlines are blurred and distance hard to judge. And gently, with his forefinger, he tapped the photograph of the child Lily Gamble in the thick, disfiguring spectacles. So, that's what you think. Lily Gamble. No, I speak only of what might be. At the time Mrs. McGinty died, Mrs. Carpenter was not yet Mrs. Carpenter. She was a young war widow, very badly off, living in a laborer's cottage. 
She was engaged to be married to the rich man of the neighborhood, a man with political ambitions and a great sense of his own importance. If Guy Carpenter had found out that he was about to marry, say, a child of low origin who had obtained notoriety by hitting her aunt on the head with a chopper, or alternatively the daughter of Craig, one of the most notorious criminals of the century, prominently placed in your chamber of horrors, well, one asks, would he have gone through with it? You say perhaps. If he loved the girl, yes. But he is not quite that kind of man. I would put him down as selfish, ambitious, and a man very nice in the manner of his reputation. I think that if young Mrs. Selkirk, as she was then, was anxious to achieve the match, she would have been very, very anxious that no hint of an unfortunate nature got to her fiancé's ears. I see. You think it's her, do you? I tell you again, mon cher, I do not know. I examine only possibilities. Mrs. Carpenter was on her guard against me, watchful, alarmed. Well, that looks bad. Yes, yes, but it is all very difficult. Once I stayed with some friends in the country, and they went out to do the shooting. You know the way it goes. One walks with the dogs and the guns, and the dogs, they put up the game, it flies out of the woods, up into the air, and you go bang, bang. That is like us. It is not only one bird we put up. Perhaps there are other birds in the covert. Birds, perhaps, with which we have nothing to do, but the birds themselves do not know that. We must make very sure, cher ami, which is our bird. During Mrs. Carpenter's widowhood, there may have been indiscretions. No worse than that, but still inconvenient. Certainly, there must be some reason why she says to me quickly that Mrs. McGinty was a liar. Superintendent Spence rubbed his nose. Let's get this clear, Poirot. What do you really think? What I think it does not matter. I must know. And as yet, the dogs have only just gone into the cover. Spence murmured. If we could get anything at all definite, one really suspicious circumstance. As it is, it's all theory, and rather far-fetched theory at that. The whole thing's thin, you know, as I said. Does anyone really murder for the reasons we've been considering? That depends, said Poirot. It depends on a lot of family circumstances we do not know. But the passion for respectability is very strong. These are not artists or bohemians. Very nice people live in Broadhinney. My postmistress said so. And nice people like to preserve their niceness. Years of happy married life, maybe. No suspicion that you were once a notorious figure in one of the most sensational murder trials. No suspicion that your child is the child of a famous murderer. One might say, I would rather die than have my husband know, or I would rather die than have my daughter discover who she is. And then you would go on to reflect, that it would be better, perhaps, if Mrs. McGinty died. Spence said quietly, So you think it's the weather bits? No. They fit the best, perhaps, but that is all. In actual character, a Mrs. Upwood is a more likely killer than Mrs. Weatherby. She has determination and willpower, and she fairly dotes on her son. To prevent his learning of what happened before she married his father and settled down to respectable married bliss, I think she might go far. Would it upset him so much? Personally, I do not think so. Young Robin has a modern, skeptical point of view, is thoroughly selfish, and in any case is less devoted, I should say, to his mother than she is to him. He is not another James Bentley. Granting Mrs. Upwood was Eva Kane, her son Robin wouldn't kill Mrs. McGinty to prevent the fact coming out? Not for a moment, I should say. He would probably capitalize on it. Use the fact for publicity for his plays. I can't see Robin Upwood committing a murder for respectability or devotion, or in fact for anything but a good solid game to Robin Upwood. Spence sighed. He said, It's a wide field. We may be able to get something on the past history of these people. But it will take time. The war has complicated things. Records destroyed, endless opportunities for people who want to cover their traces, doing so by means of other people's identity cards, etc. Especially after incidents, when nobody could know which corpse was which. If we could concentrate on just one lot. But you've got so many possibilities, Monsieur Poirot. We may be able to cut them down soon. Poirot left the superintendent's office with less cheerfulness in his heart than he had shown in his manner. 
He was obsessed, as Spence was, by the urge of time. If only he could have time. And farther back still was the one teasing doubt. Was the edifice he and Spence had built up really sound? Supposing, after all, that James Bentley was guilty, he did not give in to that doubt, but it worried him. Again and again he had gone over in his mind the interview he had had with James Bentley. He thought of it now whilst he waited on the platform at Kilchester for his train to come in. It had been market day, and the platform was crowded. More crowds were coming in through the barriers. Poirot leaned forward to look. Yes, the train was coming at last. Before he could right himself, he felt a sudden, hard, purposeful shove in the small of his back. It was so violent and so unexpected that he was taken completely unawares. In another second he would have fallen on the line under the incoming train, but a man beside him on the platform caught hold of him in the nick of time, pulling him back. "'Why, whatever came over you?' he demanded. He was a big, burly army sergeant. "'Take him queer. Man, you were nearly under the train.' "'I thank you. I thank you a thousand times.' Already the crowd was milling round them, boarding the train, others leaving it. "'All right now. I'll help you in.' Shaken, Poirot subsided onto a seat. Useless to say I was pushed, but he had been pushed. Up till that very evening he had gone about consciously on his guard, on the alert for danger, but after talking with Spence, after Spence's bantering inquiry as to whether any attempt on his life had been made, he had insensibly regarded the danger as over, or unlikely to materialise. But how wrong he had been! Amongst those he had interviewed in Broadhinney, one interview had achieved a result. Somebody had been afraid. Somebody had sought to put an end to his dangerous resuscitation of a closed case. From a call box in the station at Broadhinney, Poirot rang up Superintendent Spence. It is you, mon ami? Attend, I pray. I have news for you. Splendid news! Somebody has tried to kill me! He listened with satisfaction to the flow of remarks from the other end. No, I am not hurt. But it was a very near thing. Yes. Under a train. No, I did not see who did it. But be assured, my friend, I shall find out. We know now that we are on the right track. The man who was testing the electric meter passed the time of day with Guy Carpenter's superior manservant, who was watching him. Electricity's going to operate on a new basis, he explained. Graded flat rate according to occupancy. The superior butler remarked sceptically, What you mean is, it's going to cost more, like everything else? Well, that depends. Fair shares for all, that's what I say. Did you go into the meeting at Kilchester last night? No. Your boss, Mr. Carpenter, spoke very well, they say. Think you'll get in? It was a near shave last time, I believe. Yes. 125 majority, something like that. Do you drive him into these meetings, or does he drive himself? He usually drives himself. Likes driving. He's got a Rolls Bentley. Does himself well. Mrs. Carpenter drive too? Yes. Drives a lot too fast, in my opinion. Women usually do. Was she at the meeting last night too? Or isn't she interested in politics? The superior butler grinned. Pretends she is, anyway. However, she didn't stick it out last night, had a headache or something, and left in the middle of the speeches. Ah! The electrician peered into the fuse boxes. Nearly done now, he remarked. He put a few more desultory questions as he collected his tools and prepared to depart. He walked briskly down the drive, but round the corner from the gateway he stopped and made an entry in his pocketbook. C drove home alone last night. Reached home 10.30 approx. Could have been at Kilchester Central Station, time indicated. Mrs. C. left meeting early. Got home only ten minutes before C. Said to have come home by train. It was the second entry in the electrician's book. The first ran, Dr. R. Called out on case last night. Direction of Kilchester. Could have been at Kilchester Central Station at time indicated. Mrs. R. alone all evening in house. After taking coffee in, Mrs. Scott, housekeeper, did not see her again that night. Has small car of her own. At Laburnum's, collaboration was in process. Robin Upward was saying earnestly, You do see, don't you, 
What a wonderful line that is. And if we really get a feeling of sex antagonism between the chap and the girl, it'll pep the whole thing up enormously. Sadly, Mrs. Oliver ran her hands through her windswept grey hair, causing it to look as though swept not by wind, but by a tornado. You do see what I mean, don't you, Ariadne, darling? Oh, I see what you mean, said Mrs. Oliver gloomily. But the main thing is for you to feel really happy about it. Nobody but a really determined self-deceiver could have thought that Mrs. Oliver looked happy. Robin continued blithely. What I feel is, here's that wonderful young man, parachuted down, Mrs. Oliver interrupted. He's sixty. Oh, no. He is. Well, I don't see him like that. Thirty-five, not a day older. But I've been writing books about him for thirty years, and he was at least thirty-five in the first one. But, darling, if he's sixty... You can't have the tension between him and the girl. What's her name? Ingrid? I mean, it would make him just a nasty old man. It certainly would. So you see, he must be thirty-five, said Robin triumphantly. Then he can't be Sven Hjersen. Just make him a Norwegian young man who's in the resistance movement. But, darling Ariadne, the whole point of the play is Sven Hjersen. You've got an enormous public who simply adore Sven Hjersen, and who'll flock to see Sven Hjersen. He's box office, darling. But people who read my books know what he's like. You can't invent an entirely new young man in the Norwegian resistance movement and just call him Sven Hjersen. Ariadne, darling, I did explain all that. It's not a book, darling. It's a play. And we've just got to have glamour. And if we get this tension, this antagonism between Sven Hjersen and this, what's her name? Karen, you know, all against each other, and yet really frightfully attracted, Sven Hjersen never cared for women said Mrs. Oliver, cold. But you can't have him a pansy, darling. Not for this sort of play. I mean, it's not green bay trees or anything like that. It's thrills and murders and clean open-air fun. The mention of open-air had its effect. I think I'm going out, said Mrs. Oliver abruptly. I need air. I need air badly. Shall I come with you? asked Robin tenderly. No, I'd rather go alone. But just as you like, darling... Perhaps you're right. I'd better go and whip up an eggnog for Madre. The poor sweet is feeling just a teeny weeny bit left out of things. She does like attention, you know. And you'll think about that scene in the cellar, won't you? The whole thing is coming really wonderfully well. It's going to be the most tremendous success. I know it is. Mrs. Oliver sighed. But the main thing, continued Robin, is for you to feel happy about it. Casting a cold look at him, Mrs. Oliver threw a showy military cape, which she had once bought in Italy, about her ample shoulders, and went out into Broad Hinney. She would forget her troubles, she decided, by turning her mind to the elucidation of real crime. Hercule Poirot needed help. She would take a look at the inhabitants of Broad Hinney, exercise her woman's intuition, which had never failed, and tell Poirot who the murderer was. Then he would only have to get the necessary evidence— Mrs. Oliver started her quest by going down the hill to the post office and buying two pounds of apples. During the purchase, she entered into amicable conversation with Mrs. Sweeterman. Having agreed that the weather was very warm for the time of year, Mrs. Oliver remarked that she was staying with Mrs. Upward at Laburnum's. Yes, I know. You'll be the lady from London that writes the murder books. Three of them I've got here now in penguins. Mrs. Oliver cast a glance over the penguin display. It was slightly overlaid by children's waders. "'The affair of the second goldfish,' she mused. "'That's quite a good one. "'The cat it was who died. "'That's where I made a blowpipe a foot long and it's really six feet. "'Ridiculous that a blowpipe should be that size, "'but someone wrote from a museum to tell me so. "'Sometimes I think there are people who only read books "'in the hope of finding mistakes in them. "'What's the other one of them? "'Oh, Death of a Debutante. "'That's a frightful tripe. "'I made sulfonol soluble in water, and it isn't. "'And the whole thing is wildly impossible from start to finish. "'At least eight people die before Sven Hirsten gets his brainwave.' "'Very popular they are,' said Mrs. Sweeteman, unmoved by this interesting self-criticism. "'You wouldn't believe. I've never read any myself, because I don't really get time for reading.' "'You had a murder of your own down here, didn't you?' said Mrs. Oliver. "'Yes, last November that was. Almost next door here, as you might say. "'I hear there's a detective down here looking into it. "'Ah, you mean the little foreign gentleman up at Long Meadows? "'He was in here only yesterday, and—' "'Mrs. Sweeteman broke off as another customer entered for stamps.' She bustled round to the post office side. Good morning, Miss Henderson. Warm for the time of year today? Yes, it is. Mrs. Oliver stared hard at the tall girl's back. She had a cilium with her on a lead. 
means the fruit blossom will get nipped later," said Mrs. Sweeteyman with gloomy relish. "How's Mrs. Weatherby keeping?" "Fairly well, thank you. She hasn't been out much. There's been such an east wind lately. There is a very good picture on at Kilchester this week, Miss Henderson. You ought to go." "I thought of going last night, but I couldn't really bother. It's Betty Grable next week. Oh, I'm out of five shilling books and stamps. Will two and six ones do you?" As the girl went out, Mrs. Oliver said, "Mrs. Weatherby's an invalid, isn't she?" "That's as may be," Mrs. Sweeteyman replied rather acidly. "There's some of us as hasn't the time to lay by." "I do so agree with you," said Mrs. Oliver. "I tell Mrs. Upward that if she'd only make more of an effort to use her legs, it would be better for her." Mrs. Sweeteyman looked amused. "She gets a boat when she wants to, or so I've heard." "Does she now?" Mrs. Oliver considered the source of information. Janet, she hazarded. Janet Groom grumbles a bit," said Mrs. Sweeteyman. "And you can hardly wonder, can you? Miss Groom's not so young herself, and she has the rheumatism cruel bad when the wind's in the east. But archetitis, it's called, when it's the gentry has it, and invalid chairs and what not. Ah, well, I wouldn't risk losing the use of my legs. I wouldn't. But there, nowadays, even if you've got a chilblain, you run to the doctor with it so as to get your money's worth out of the national health. Too much of this health business we've got never did any good thinking how bad you feel. I expect you're right." Said Mrs. Oliver. She picked up her apples and went out in pursuit of Deirdre Henderson. This was not difficult, since the Celium was old and fat and was enjoying a leisurely examination of tufts of grass and pleasant smells. Dogs, Mrs. Oliver considered, were always a means of introduction. What a darling! She exclaimed. The big young woman with the plain face looked gratified. He is rather attractive, she said. Aren't you, Ben? Ben looked up, gave a slight wiggle of his saucy. Resumed his nasal inspection of a tuft of thistles, approved it, and proceeded to register approval in the usual manner. Does he fight? Asked Mrs. Oliver. Celiums do very often. Yes, he's an awful fighter. That's why I keep him on the lead. I thought so. Both women considered the celium. Then Deirdre Henderson said, with a kind of rush, "You're, you're Ariadne Oliver, aren't you?" Yes, I'm staying with the Upwards. I know. Robin told us you were coming. I must tell you how much I enjoy your books. Mrs. Oliver, as usual, went purple with embarrassment. No,、oh, she murmured unhappily. I'm very glad, she added gloomily. I haven't read as many of them as I'd like to because we get books sent down from the Times Book Club, and Mother doesn't like detective stories. She's frightfully sensitive, and they keep her awake at night. But I adore them. You've had a real crime, Downey Her, haven't you? Said Mrs. Oliver. Which house was it? What are these cottages? That one there. Deirdre Henderson spoke in a rather choked voice. Mrs. Oliver directed her gaze on Mrs. McGinty's former dwelling, the front doorstep of which was at present occupied by two unpleasant little kittles, who were happily torturing a cat. As Mrs. Oliver stepped forward to remonstrate, the cat escaped by a firm use of its claws. The eldest kittle. Who had been severely scratched set up a howl. Serves you right," said Mrs. Oliver, adding to Deirdre Henderson, "It doesn't look like a house where there's been a murder, does it?" "No, it doesn't." Both women seemed to be in accord about that. Mrs. Oliver continued, "An old charwoman, wasn't it? And somebody robbed her." Her lodger. She had some money under the floor. I see. Deirdre Henderson said suddenly. But perhaps it wasn't him after all. There's a funny little man down here, a foreigner. His name's Hercule Poirot. Hercule Poirot? Oh yes, I know all about him. Is he really a detective? My dear, he's frightfully celebrated and terribly clever. Then perhaps he'll find out that he didn't do it after all. Who? The, the lodger, James Bentley. Oh, I do hope he'll get off. Do you? Why? Because I don't want it to be him, I never wanted it to be him. Mrs. Oliver looked at her curiously, startled by the passion in her voice. Did you know him? No," said Deirdre slowly. "I didn't know him, but once Ben got his foot caught in a trap, and he helped me to get him free, and we talked a little. What was he like? He was dreadfully lonely. His mother had just died. He was frightfully fond of his mother." And you are very fond of yours," said Mrs. Oliver acutely. "Yes, that made me understand, understand what he felt. I mean, 
Mother and I, we've just got each other, you see. I thought the Robin told me you had a stepfather, Deirdre said bitterly. Oh, yes, I've got a stepfather, Mrs. Oliver said vaguely. It's not the same thing, is it, as one's own father? Do you remember your own father? No, he died before I was born. Mother married Mr. Weatherby when I was four years old. I... I've always hated him. And Mother... She paused before saying, Mother's had a very sad life. She's had no sympathy or understanding. My stepfather is a most unfeeling man. Hard and cold. Mrs. Oliver nodded and then murmured, This James Bentley doesn't sound at all like a criminal. I never thought the police would arrest him. I'm sure it must have been some tramp. There are horrid tramps along this road sometimes. It must have been one of them. Mrs. Oliver said consolingly, Perhaps Hercule Poirot will find out the truth. Yes, perhaps. She turned off abruptly into the gateway of Hunter's Close. Mrs. Oliver looked after her for a moment or two, then drew a small notebook from her handbag. In it she wrote, Not Deirdre Henderson, and underlined the not so firmly that the pencil broke. Halfway up the hill, she met Robin Upward coming down it with a handsome, platinum-haired young woman. Robin introduced them. This is the wonderful Ariadne Oliver, Eve, he said. My dear, I don't know how she does it. Looks so benevolent, too, doesn't she? Not at all as though she wallowed in crime. This is Eve Carpenter. Her husband is going to be our next member, the present one. Sir George Cartwright is quite gaga, poor old man. He jumps out at young girls from behind doors. Robin, you mustn't invent such terrible lies. You'll discredit the party. Well, why should I care? It isn't my party. I'm a liberal. That's the only party it's possible to belong to nowadays. Really small and select, and without a chance of getting in. I adore lost causes, he added to Mrs. Oliver. Eve wants us to come in for drinks this evening. A sort of party for you, Ariadne. You know, meet the lion. We're all terribly, terribly thrilled to have you here. Can't you put the scene of your next murder in Broad Hinney? Oh, do, Mrs. Oliver, said Eve Carpenter. You can easily get Sven Hirsen down here, said Robin. He can be like Hercule Poirot, staying at the Summer Hayes Guest House. We're just going there now, because I told Eve Hercule Poirot is just as much a celebrity in his line as you are in yours. And she says she was rather rude to him yesterday, so she's going to ask him to the party too. But seriously, dear, do make your next murder happen in Broad Henny. We'd all be so thrilled. Oh, do, Mrs. Oliver. It would be such fun, said Eve Carpenter. Who shall we have as murderer, and who as victim? asked Robin. Who is your present charwoman? asked Mrs. Oliver. Oh, my dear, not that kind of murder, so dull. No, I think Eve here would make a rather nice victim, strangled, perhaps, with her own nylon stockings. No, that's been done. I think you'd better be murdered, Robin, said Eve, the coming playwright, stabbed in country cottage. We haven't settled on a murderer yet, said Robin. What about my mamma, using her wheelchair so that there wouldn't be any footprints? I think that would be lovely. She wouldn't want to stab you, though, Robin. Robin considered. No, perhaps not. As a matter of fact, I was considering her strangling you. She wouldn't mind doing that half as much. But I want you to be the victim, and the person who kills you can be Deirdre Henderson, the repressed plain girl whom nobody notices. There you are, Ariadne, said Robin. The whole plot of your next novel presented to you. All you have to do is work in a few false clues and, of course, do the actual writing. Oh, goodness, what terrible dogs Maureen does have. They had turned in at the gate of Long Meadows, and two Irish wolfhounds had rushed forward, barking. Maureen Summerhays came out into the stable yard with a bucket in her hand. Down, Flynn. Come here, Cormac. Hello. I'm just cleaning out Piggy's stable. We know that, darling, said Robin. We can smell you from here. How's Piggy getting along? We had a terrible fright about him yesterday. He was lying down, and he didn't want his breakfast. Johnny and I read up all the diseases in the pig book and couldn't sleep for worrying about him. But this morning, he was frightfully well and gay and absolutely charged Johnny when Johnny came in with his food. Knocked him flat, as a matter of fact. Johnny had to go and have a bath. What exciting lives you and Johnny lead, said Robin. Eve said, Will you and Johnny come in and have drinks with us this evening, Maureen? Love to. To meet Mrs. Oliver, said Robin. But actually, you can meet her now. This is she. 
Are you really? said Maureen. How thrilling. You and Robin are doing a play together, aren't you? It's coming along splendidly, said Robin. By the way, Ariadne, I had a brainwave after you went out this morning about casting. Oh, casting, said Mrs. Oliver in a relieved voice. I know just the right person to play Eric. Cecil Leach. He's playing in the little rep at Cullen Key. We'll run over and see the show one evening. We want your PG, said Eve to Maureen. Is he about? I want to ask him tonight, too. We'll bring him along, said Maureen. I think I'd better ask him myself. As a matter of fact, I was a bit rude to him yesterday. Oh, well, uh, he's somewhere about, said Maureen vaguely. In the garden, I think. Cormac? Flynn? Those damn dogs. She dropped the bucket with a clatter and ran in the direction of the duck pond, whence a furious quacking had arisen. Mrs. Oliver, glass in hand, approached Hercule Poirot towards the end of the carpenter's party. Up till that moment, they had each of them been the centre of an admiring circle. Now that a good deal of gin had been consumed, and the party was going well, there was a tendency for old friends to get together and retail local scandal. And the two outsiders were able to talk to each other. "'Come out on the terrace,' said Mrs. Oliver, in a conspirator's whisper. At the same time, she pressed into his hand a small piece of paper. Together, they stepped out through the French windows and walked along the terrace. Poirot unfolded the piece of paper. "'Dr. Rendon," he read. He looked questioningly at Mrs. Oliver. Mrs. Oliver nodded vigorously, a large plume of grey hair falling across her face as she did so. "'He's the murderer,' said Mrs. Oliver. "'You think so? Why?' "'I just know it,' said Mrs. Oliver. "'He's the type.' Hearty and genial, or all that. Perhaps. Poirot sounded unconvinced. But what would you say was his motive? Unprofessional conduct, said Mrs. Oliver. And Mrs. McGinty knew all about it. But whatever the reason was, you can be quite sure it was him. I've looked at all the others, and he's the one. In reply, Poirot remarked conversationally, Last night, somebody tried to push me onto the railway line at Kirchester Station. Good gracious! To kill you, do you mean? I have no doubt that was the idea. And Dr. Rendell was out on a case. I know he was. I understand, yes, that Dr. Rendell was out on a case. Then that settles it, said Mrs. Oliver with satisfaction. Not quite, said Poirot. Both Mr. and Mrs. Carpenter were in Kilchester last night and came home separately. Mrs. Rendell may have sat at home all the evening listening to her wireless, or she may not. No one can say. Miss Henderson often goes to the pictures in Kilchester. Well, she didn't last night. She was at home. She told me so. You cannot believe all you are told, said Poirot, reprovingly. Families hang together. The foreign maid, Frida, on the other hand, was at the pictures last night. So she cannot tell us who was or was not at home at Hunter's Clothes. You see, it is not so easy to narrow things down. "'Well, I can probably vouch for our lot,' said Mrs. Oliver. "'What time did you say this happened?' "'At 9.35 exactly.' "'Then, at any rate, Laburnum's has got a clean bill of health. "'From eight o'clock to half-past ten, Robin, his mother, and I were playing poker patience. "'I thought possibly that you and he were closeted together doing the collaboration. "'Leaving Mamma to leap on a motor bicycle concealed in the shrubbery.' Mrs. Oliver laughed. No, Mamma was under our eye. She sighed as sadder thoughts came to her. Collaboration, she said bitterly. The whole thing's a nightmare. How would you like to see a big black moustache stuck on to Superintendent Battle and be told it was you? Poirot blinked a little. But it is a nightmare, that suggestion. Now you know what I suffer. I, too, suffer, said Poirot. The cooking of Madame Sanghaise, it is beyond description. It is not cooking at all. And the draughts, the cold winds, the upset stomachs of the cats, the long hairs of the dogs, the broken legs of the chairs, the terrible, terrible bed in which I sleep. He shut his eyes in remembrance of agonies, the tepid water in the bathroom, the holes in the stair carpet, and the coffee. Words cannot describe to you the fluid which they serve to you as coffee. It is an affront to the stomach. Dear me, said Mrs. Oliver, and yet you know, she's awfully nice. Mrs. Summerhays? She is charming. She is quite charming. That makes it much more difficult. 
Here she comes now, said Mrs. Oliver. Maureen Summerhays was approaching them. There was an ecstatic look on her freckled face. She carried a glass in her hand. She smiled at them both with affection. Ha! I think I'm a bit diddly, she announced. Such lots of lovely gin. <laughs> I do like parties. We don't often have one in Broad Hinney. It's because of you both being so celebrated. I wish I could write books. The trouble with me is I, I can't do anything properly. You are a good wife and mother, madame, said Poirot primly. Maureen's eyes opened. Attractive, hazel eyes in a small, freckled face. Mrs. Oliver wondered how old she was. Not much more than thirty, she guessed. Am I? said Maureen. I wonder. I love them all terribly. But is that enough? Poirot coughed. If you will not think me presumptuous, madame, a wife who truly loves her husband should take great care of his stomach. It is important, the stomach. Maureen looked slightly affronted. Johnny's got a wonderful stomach, she said indignantly. Absolutely flat. Practically not a stomach at all. I was referring to what is put inside it. Oh, you mean my cooking, said Maureen. I never think it matters much what one eats. Poirot groaned. Or what one wears, said Maureen dreamily. Or what one does. I don't think things matter. Not really. She was silent for a moment or two, her eyes alcoholically hazy, as though she was looking into the far distance. There was a woman writing in the paper the other day, she said suddenly, a really stupid letter. Asking what was best to do, to let your child be adopted by someone who could give it every advantage, every advantage, that's what she said, and she meant a good education, and clothes and comfortable surroundings, or whether to keep it when you couldn't give it advantages of any kind. I think that's stupid, really stupid. If you can just give a child enough to eat, that's all that matters. She stared down into her empty glass as though it were a crystal. I ought to know she said. I was an adopted child. My mother parted with me, and I had every advantage, as they call it, and it's always hurt, always, always, to know that you weren't really wanted, that your mother could let you go. It was a sacrifice for your good, perhaps, said Poirot. Her clear eyes met his. I don't think that's ever true. It's the way they put it to themselves, but what it boils down to is that they can really get on without you. And it hurts. I wouldn't give up my children, not for all the advantages in the world. I think you're quite right, said Mrs. Oliver. And I too agree, said Poirot. Then that's all right, said Maureen cheerfully. What are we arguing about? Robin, who had come along the terrace to join them, said, Yes, what are you arguing about? Adoption, said Maureen. I don't like being adopted. Do you? Well, it's much better than being an orphan. Don't you think so, darling? I think we ought to go now. Don't you, Annie Adney? The guests left in a body. Dr. Rendell had already had to hurry away. They walked down the hill together, talking gaily with that extra hilarity that a series of cocktails induces. When they reached the gate of Laburnum's, Robin insisted that they should all come in. Just to tell Madre all about the party. So boring for her, poor sweet, not to have been able to go because her leg was playing her up. But she so hates being left out of things. They surged in cheerfully, and Mrs. Upwood seemed pleased to see them. Who else was there? she asked. The Weatherbys? No, Mrs. Weatherby didn't feel well enough, and that dim Henderson girl wouldn't come without her. She's really rather pathetic, isn't she? said Sheila Rendell. I think almost pathological, don't you? said Robin. It's that mother of hers, said Maureen. Some mothers really do almost eat their young, don't they? She flushed suddenly as she met Mrs. Upwood's quizzical eye. Do I devour you, Robin? Mrs. Upwood asked. Madre, of course not. To cover her confusion, Maureen hastily plunged into an account of her breeding experiences with Irish wolfhounds. The conversation became technical. Mrs. Upwood said decisively, You can't get away from heredity. 
in people as well as dogs. Sheila Rendell murmured, Don't you think it's environment? Mrs. Upwood cut her short. No, my dear, I don't. Environment can give a veneer, no more. It's what's bred in people that counts. Hercule Poirot's eyes rested curiously on Sheila Rendell's flushed face. She said with what seemed unnecessary passion, But that's cruel, unfair. Mrs. Upwood said, Life is unfair. The slow, lazy voice of Johnny Summerhays joined in. I agree with Mrs. Upwood. Reading tells. That's been my creed always. Mrs. Oliver said questioningly, You mean things are handed down until the third or fourth generation? Maureen Summerhays said suddenly, in her sweet high voice, But that quotation goes on. And show mercy unto thousands. Once again, everybody seemed a little embarrassed. Perhaps at the serious note that had crept into the conversation, they made a diversion by attacking Poirot. Tell us all about Mrs. McGinty, Monsieur Poirot. Why didn't the dreary lodger kill her? He used to mutter, you know, said Robin. Walking about in the lanes, I've often met him, and really, definitely, he looked frightfully queer. You must have some reason for thinking he didn't kill her, Monsieur Poirot. Do tell us. Poirot smiled at them. He twirled his moustache. If he didn't kill her, who did? Yes, who did? Mrs. Upwood said dryly, Don't embarrass the man. He probably suspects one of us. One of us? Ooh! In the clamour, Poirot's eyes met those of Mrs. Upwood. They were amused, and something else. Challenging? He suspects one of us, said Robin delightedly. Now then, Maureen, he assumed the manner of a bullying K.C. Where were you on the night of the, uh, what night was it? November 22nd, said Poirot. On the night of the 22nd. Gracious, 